Looks like it's the 13th day of August 2018, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. This is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but also heard on a variety of other networks, and of course available further on down the stream by your final slab of choice, your applicable application, your podcatcher du jour, etc., etc. Anyway, no matter how it is you're coming to the show, you are welcome. It is a moon day or a Monday uh, on that calendar, too. I know that much. Now, we weren't planning on having Jordan Maxwell on this Monday day because he had something else to do but you know what plans change so guess what part seven of our discussion on religion uh and this has been a a continued series that i'm extremely happy to do um mostly mostly i i really have tried to stay out of jordan's way pretty much (laughs) as much as i can but but i have to you know me i gotta chime in sometimes and i've got to say a few things here and there i mean uh what what, what good is a talk show host who doesn't talk but you know it, it is uh it is great to have you with us again jordan and i'm very very happy to uh to do this with you and and to continue doing this with you until we're done we're still not quite sure where the end of this is are we no not really no because there's so much uh, that we need to talk about in relation to the Old Testament. And when we're through with that, then we got the whole New Testament, which is a completely, totally different story than what Christians have been told. And so I don't know when we'll get to the end of it. We'll just keep, you know, keep plowing through until we do. And I know that I might uh, perhaps on occasions... Um, uh, um, you know, say things that I've already said and repeat myself. But that's the way I, you know, that's the way I teach. I do this in classes too. And sometimes I'll repeat myself. But I try and, uh, to remember everything that's important. So sometimes I do repeat important things. And so, uh, mm. you say that, you know, and the reason why you are having me on tonight because I had told you that I wasn't going to be in town. I was supposed to be out of town, but now that fell through, and so here I am and on tonight. Yeah. Right, and again, I do appreciate it. Now, I, I've gotten some feedback from you guys, and I'm going to uh, put the questions to Jordan that you sent me, which you can send me through email. You can go to the live chat room, or if you're on my Skype list, I will answer them. If I can answer them, if they're meant for me, if they're meant for Jordan, I will simply ask him on the show uh, whatever yep. questions you guys pose that are logical and reasonable to the discussion. Okay, yep. so info at Ocelli.com, that's how you can email them if that's the way you want to go. And before we get into this, I also want to remind you that uh, there is only one website, which is Jordan Maxwell's, Okay. Uh, there are many people out there that are using his name. There are many websites, whatever, but here is the website to go to, jordanmaxwellshow.com. That's right, all together, one phrase, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Now, when you go there, that is the only website which is Jordan's, but there is also a button where you can go into the Research Society, and this is where you can get much deeper into a great many topics, including the one we're discussing tonight, but believe me, it goes way beyond this. (laughs) Okay, one section is very much focused on what it is we've been talking about here, and there is a ton of information there, e-books, images, articles, uh, you know, written works of all sorts, images there that are put together. I've never seen this kind of thing assembled in one place. It's a way to go deeper, farther into these subjects, and I'm sure we'll talk about it a little more during this next two hours or, well, a little less now. But either way, jordanmaxwellshow.com is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's. Got it? Okay. Now, uh, Jordan, did you want to start off with the listener questions? Yes, that sounds good. Uh, get us going. Well, let's do that because we inspired some some stuff that was different this time. Uh, and I don't know if it was from the most recent episode because people are jumping back and forth now. Uh, there, there's a playlist on YouTube 
which has uh, all of the episodes that we've done. All six parts are up there. Part six was actually split into two parts because uh, I wanted to give it the best sound quality. I thought it was actually the best show that we that 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 you have put out out of this series, and I wanted to make sure people heard every single thing uh, with with you know drop of a pin clarity. So well, um, I appreciate it and thank you. No yeah. problem. And and uh, obviously they're at my website. And if Jordan wants to make them available or put them up on his website, that's between him and his webmaster. But I will always make this stuff as available as possible. Okay, so. Uh, some of these questions came from some weird spots. Now, of course, we got a few people who were complaining, you know, why are you picking on the Catholics? And, uh, why is it that, uh, you know, you're, you're supporting a, a devil worship think and this kind of thing. And it's like, listen, there is no devil worship here. I tried to explain that in the last episode. So I guess you didn't hear that, <laughs> but yeah, well, uh, I can clarify that again. I don't mind. We can, uh, I have some comments about that. If you'd like to start off with that. Well, we, you know, we could, but I, really, I, I'd rather get to the people that are actually thinking about what you're saying and hearing it. But if you if you wish to address it, you know, go go ahead. Uh, there there is no there there is no support of the adversary happening here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, no, I, know. I, 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 know I know that you know that anybody with 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 a mind who is hearing what we're saying uh, yeah. certainly knows that. But you know, feel free to address it if you like. Well, I would like to say that first of all, I have. A uh, very high uh, regard for the concept, the very idea of God. Now we can discuss back and forth for the next two two years as to what you mean about God, as opposed to what I, you know, mean when I use the word God. Uh, we need to define our terms anytime you're discussing uh, arcane subjects and difficult subjects. You need to. Uh, you know, clarify what you're talking about. The, I am not talking about the Catholic people. My mother and my father, and my brother, and my whole family were Catholics. My my mom is my my whole family is gone now, and I miss them terribly. But they were all Catholic, and I was too. I was raised Catholic, so I'm not condemning the Catholic people. I'd never condemn my own mother, and I would never condemn all my friends that I had. What I'm saying is that when I was very young, I really had uh, an appetite for learning. I wanted to understand uh, what I believe and why I believe it and be able to talk publicly about it, like the Bible says, be able to defend your belief intelligently, intellectually and intelligently uh, to people who don't believe. And so I really just grew up that way. I just loved knowledge. I wanted to learn why things are the way they are. And if we're going to talk about God and the heavens and the demons and devils and angels, what are you talking about? Well, translate that so I can understand it. And so I used to go to different churches when I was a kid. My mom would let me go to anything I wanted, any churches I wanted, and I did. All the time I would go with my friends in school to their churches, hoping that I could find someone who was intellectually astute on these kind of questions about theology. And as a little kid, I just wanted to know about God. I want to know. I don't want to believe anything because I know when you believe something, you re you, you are relying on on your own understanding to the best of your ability. So this is what you believe. I don't want to believe. I want to know for a fact. And I want to understand it so I can explain it to others, why I believe something. I, I can prove it to an audience of people why I believe something, or at least show the audience how I came to my different uh, uh, understandings and my different belief systems. So... I have the highest respect for God, so to speak. I know that there is a divine presence in the universe that, that men have called God. I refer to it as the Great Spirit. And I believe that there is a divine, intelligent, profoundly wise spirit that governs life on the earth and governs our universe. Mm. And so I don't have any problem with the idea of God. 
and I love the, the, the nature of the world that we live in, the nature of animals and the, the life forms that we have on the earth. And I realized they didn't just pop in out of nowhere, out of evolution. Right. Someone created all of this beautiful thing that we call our world and our life. And so I don't have any problem with, uh, with bowing to a higher force that men have called God. I, I, I do believe in God. What I am trying to say is that for way too many centuries, organizations, men's personal organizations that they founded and put together, our, our companies and corporations and businesses and, and churches and banks and whatever else you want to <clears throat> look at that we humans have put together, we put things together as a business for a purpose, for a reason. And so I I learned a long time ago from the inside that so much of our belief systems and our government and what we believe about the law enforcement and what we believe about the military and the police department and banks, insurance companies and religions and, and all kinds of things that – um, man-made institutions that we use and we believe in uh, are not what you think they are. They are created by humans. They're created by people. <clears throat> and so even at a young age, I realized that. And that's why I was going to <clears throat> different churches so I could learn, hopefully learn, from uh, you know from older people and from uh, people who were teaching the theologies and religions. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so that's why I would go to the different churches uh, all, all the time with my young friends, <clears throat> hoping to learn and, and understand God, my life, and who I am, and why am I here, and where are we going. And uh, I... I became very, very distraught, very, very uh, disheartened because everywhere I went and all the different groups and different churches and synagogues and everywhere else I went, nobody ever took the time to explain anything simple to me because it was not – it was as if a simple things, simple questions that a child would have uh, it's just mind-boggling to adults because they've never thought on that level as a child. And so I would ask questions and the adults would look at me like I was a fool, like I had two heads. And so <clears throat> I realized that the adults are actually, and I knew this when I was 9 and 10 years old, I used to say this to my mom and dad, you know, adults are just grown-up children. I mean, I'll be an adult soon, and one day I'll be your age. But I'm just a child right now, so what's going to change? Nothing. Nothing's going to change. I don't know anything right now. I don't understand anything because I'm a child. And every time I ask adults that I go to churches and I ask them questions about God, they don't know either. So it became apparent to me by the ripe old age of 12, 13, 14 years old that adults are simply grown-up children. Their bodies have matured, but their brains are still at the 7th and 8th grade level. And so uh, I, I began to realize that if you're going to find out something, then do it yourself because you're not going to find it in a church. You're not going to find it in a religion, because people who are in charge of the different churches don't know a thing about what it is they're doing. And, and it became apparent to me that churches and religions are nothing more than social arrangements, like the Cub Scouts and the ladies' clubs and the, uh, and the Masonic orders for the men and the women's clubs for women and, and the uh, Campfire Girls. It's these are all social groups where the different groups of, of humans can get together. You know, teenagers can get together, and or grown men, businessmen can get together. And so I realized that, that all the world is made up of associations where people get together of like mind, people who like a particular you know, uh, a philosophy, a particular belief, they all hang out together and 
people who belong to a particular church uh, or belong to a political party. They all hang out together. And so I just viewed coming up as a child that the religious philosophies and churches and synagogues and temples all around the world were nothing but social arrangements where people of like mind who collectively do not know <clears throat> what they're doing. They have no idea <clears throat> about what they believe. Uh, they have no concept conceptual reality they have no concept of what they're talking about god and they get all excited if you talk about god but nobody knows what god is i said god is dog spell backwards and so i i realized that the whole world is lying in ignorance everywhere i go and then as i grew up i grew older and began to lecture on these subjects that i was reading and studying 24 hours a day when everybody else was on skateboards and going to football games in school i was in the in the uh, libraries university libraries reading and studying history where did things come from and, and the longer I did that, the more it became apparent to me that that's the way you learn. If you want to know, then do your own homework. Go out and spend weeks and months and years in university libraries. You don't have to go necessarily to a university for four or five, six years because that is a curriculum which is already decided for you to teach you what, what they want you to know so they will give you uh, a permit to work. It's a working permit. They give you a license to go to work. I don't need a license to go to work. I'm trying to find out who I am and where did we come from and, worst of all, where are we going when we die because you get ready for it. You're going to leave this planet one day, and when you do, whatever it is you thought you believed, you're going to find out on the other side you didn't know what was going on. You had no idea about the history of this earth and the history of religions and concepts and ideas and belief systems. And so that's what I've been trying to do all my life is I've lived my life in libraries, university libraries, the big seminary libraries all over the country. Let, let me ask, let me interrupt questions. you and ask you one of the relevant questions to exactly what you're talking about right now that was sent mm -hmm. in. Uh, first of all, they wanted to know if you were familiar with Manly P. Hall, and also have you ever been to the Philosophical Research Society Library in California, which apparently contains a whole lot of philosophical and uh, also religious uh, uh, artifacts, data, uh, manuscripts and books. Have you ever been there, and are you familiar with it? Manly P. Hall was not only a personal friend of mine that I used to go to his home, but when he passed away in his will, I was called uh, by um, Obadiah Harris, who was at that time the president and chairman of the board of the Manly P. Hall Philosophical Research Society. It's a big university in Los Angeles on Los Feliz Street. And I got a phone call. I was working at the Truth Seeker Company in San Diego. And, uh, and uh, Obadiah said, Jordan, Mr. Hall left a will and you are in it. Uh, and he has left you something <clears throat> very valuable and he wanted you to have it. And I said, Obadiah, what did he leave me? He said, I'm not going to tell you. You just come up here and you'll see it. So I immediately got in my car that day and drove up to Los Angeles from San Diego and went over because I've been to Mr. Hall's library uh, hundreds of times just over the years I've been there. and Used to go there on Sundays and hear Mr. Uh, Hall's lectures and talks. I was fascinated by the brilliance. This is what I've been looking for all my life. Somebody who had the answers. Somebody who knew what the words meant and broke down the etymology of the concepts of where these ideas have come from. Well, that was the tremendous work Mr. Hall had done. 
And so when I got there to find out what he had left me <clears throat> in his will, Mr. Hall left me all of his research uh, volumes. Uh, they were his research journals. And there was, there was I don't even know, maybe 100, 150 of them, uh, beautiful journals with all of his research in them. And going all the way back to 1936 to the, you know, to the day he passed. And he left it all no present to me. And so that shocked me. I was actually rather taken back. I was shocked at such a phenomenal, uh, 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 you know, a treasure Mr. Hall would personally leave to me in his will. And so I not only knew Mr. Hall personally, I, I, I used to, as a matter of fact, but just a, uh, a few months before he passed away, mm-hmm. I gave him an award. I was part of an organization called U.S. of A, United Sensitives of America, and I was on the governing body of the, of the organization, and it was a group a large group of, of different uh, what we call sensitives, uh, psychics, researchers, historians, numerologists, all kinds of interesting people, some of them writers for television, etc., on esoteric and occult subjects. And I was on the I was on the board of directors with that organization. And so we had a big, oh, every year we would have a big fun, oh, we'd have, not, not a fundraiser, but we'd have a big award dinner where we would give awards to certain people who have done, um, you know, very big things for the human family, uh, teachers and lecturers and, and researchers, etc. And so uh, I suggested Mr. Hall, and we did, we did uh, give him an award, and he was there that night. And I was so absolutely delighted I was able to introduce Mr. Hall, my dear friend, and uh, not knowing that he was leaving me his, his, all his research journals and the will. But, uh, yes, I knew Mr. Hall, and he was an incredibly brilliant man. I do believe, and it's just my, my personal belief, that Mr. Hall was probably one of the uh, uh, one of the most incredible spiritual minds that has ever visited our earth. This man uh, could speak for hours upon hours on all the intricacies of religion, theologies, concepts, and belief systems of where they came from and what they meant and how to understand them in relation to today's world. And he's, my God, he must have written 50 or 60 books and hundreds and hundreds of articles and, and given thousands of lectures quite literally around the world and through his own uh, college and university. Uh, the man was an astoundingly brilliant, uh, you know, in theories and understanding religions and government and historians. Uh, there's no one like him. There's never been anyone like him. Right. And we talk about the great philosophers of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans and uh, and all of that. But as far as I'm concerned, there's nobody came close to Mr. Manley P. Hall, who was a brilliant and wonderful and dear man, and he was a dear friend of mine. And so uh, I, I'm just amazed that I even got to know him. But he was the answer a long time ago to I knew that there was information out there in the world and I wanted it so bad as the scripture says knock and it will be open and seek and you will find ask and it will be given well I was seeking and knocking and going to every church I could every group every every research society every uh, wherever I could go to hear speakers explain to me the world I live in Nobody ever accomplished that. Nobody ever knew enough to tell me anything. So I was just wasting my young years going to churches where nobody knew what they were doing. Nobody had the faintest idea about what I'm talking about until I met Mr. Hall, who that's all he did was explain the world to you. 
everything, where all the religions have come from, uh, where all the philosophies came from, what they meant, what the words meant, the etymology of the terms. Uh, it was such an extraordinary experience. And from there, that was in my, uh, my 18, 19 year old. And then from there, I began to go deeply. Now that I have, uh, now that I know the basics, now I know what's going on here. And I understand the lies and the deception that the world believes because they don't know. This is why I feel like I said before, if you go to a church today, people will ask you, oh, are you a believer? Yes, I'm a believer. And so, oh, well, how long have you been a believer? And so they have books in, in, in church libraries and church bookstores called uh, with the term believer in it. A lot of the books are called Believers, House of Faith, or Believers This, or Believers That. It implies you believe something, which implies you don't know anything, but you believe something. I don't want to believe. I have been too often, too often, I have been misled. Why? Because I didn't know. And I thought that these people who were older than me, they have white and gray hair, and I assumed they were the teachers. Mm -hmm. I listened to them, and then I would ask them questions, and then they would look at me as a child like a deer in the headlights of a car. They had no idea what I'm talking about. Right. And so, therefore, like Albert Einstein said one time in one of his books, he said, the teachers used to tell us that we had to answer their questions. But I asked, how come you can't answer our questions? And that's what I felt. I have questions that the, that the teachers of religion couldn't answer. Why? Because they're too simple-minded. Just a child would think of them. And I would ask certain, I just ask a question and the priest would look at me like I'm a fool. I got three heads because he didn't know what the, he didn't know how to answer the question. I would ask my parents. I would ask people all around me, adults. Nobody seemed to know what they were doing. And so therefore I pretty much assumed that grown ups are just grown up in body, but in their minds, they're still children. They don't know anything. I want to know. I want to prove it. I want somebody to show me what it is that's happening and prove it to me so I can understand it correctly. And that you're not going to get in any church or any synagogue or any temple or any, uh, or any Islamic temple. You're not going to get that anywhere in the religious community of this world because the truth is not in religions. Right. There is no truth. In religion, it's a belief system. But once you get past that and wake up and now begin to mature, not just your body, but your mind, and begin to question things. And if you really want to know, and if you're intellectually honest and are ready to hear the real truth, it's out there. All you need to do <clears throat> is just go ask and it will be given. Knock and it will be open. Seek and you will find. Right. And what was really interesting about uh, about Mr. Hall is that he had, you know, people to point to the patronage he had, which was extremely helpful in collecting uh, the, the baseline of what he collected in that library for certain. Um, but <clears throat> the fact is this guy knew where to go, too. He traveled all over the world, even during the time of the Depression, when... The Depression was oh, worldwide. Yeah. It wasn't just in America. And he went and found some very unique things that are in that library. Uh, oh, did he ever. Yeah. It, was, it was enormous. <clears throat> His personal library, if you've ever been to the Philosophical Research Society, which is a university-type uh, school that Mr. Hall set up, <clears throat> and he had his own personal library, which was... A, a, a two-story two high uh, wa uh, walls and walls and walls of reference books from all over the world on every subject you can imagine. But that was the public side of his personal library. He allowed the public to see. But if you go behind the scenes, he had another library at PRS that nobody gets to see. And it was his personal library, which is, again, filled with walls of, of massive volumes, 
and there was very i couldn't think of a subject that asked him that he could not sit down for 90 minutes to two hours and explain it in minute detail and show you exactly where things have come from exactly what the words meant in the ancient roman empire as opposed to the babylonian empire and what these words and terms and ideas and phrases that you hear today in religions where they actually came from and they don't mean what you thought they did and boy when i started waking up to the fact that man there has been a world of knowledge hidden from the human family my god how much that you don't know that you've never been told that is overwhelming and obvious when somebody <clears throat> finally shows it to you they finally sit you down and say are you ready to hear the real truth fine here's where it really came from here's what you're actually talking about when you're talking about <clears throat> somebody being anointed and you call Jesus the anointed. Do you know what anointed means? Where it came from? The etymology of not only the word, but the concept. It goes back to sex. It goes back to sexual connections between humans. It's called anointing. And then when you get into all of the different stories in the Old Testament, basically boils down to sex and drugs, alcohol, and business, and corporations, and, and laws, and my God, what, a, what an education it has been for me for the past 60 years of peering behind the veil of the darkness that we call world religions. Mm. It's an extraordinary story. Absolutely, that, and uh, you know, I want to add, add in another question which has something to do with behind the veil a bit. Um, now, I've cut this down from a much longer email to get to the core of the question. But <clears throat> they've asked a great deal about uh, about the uh, the reality behind, you know, Freemasons and the idea that, uh, you know, in order to join the Freemasons, you have to believe in a higher power of some type. And there's uh, a lot of dispute and discussion about this and all that. And it's a very long. They gave me like four or five paragraphs before yeah. they got to this question. <laughs> And uh, they wanted to know really about Sirius, the dog star. Now, of course, I think back to just what you said a few minutes ago regarding how, uh, you know, the dog star and, well, God and dog, you just flip the words around and there you go. You got the same thing. But here's uh, here's what the question is. At the highest levels of the Freemasons, uh, you know, what God do they worship? Because it appears as though from their research that uh, it has something to do with the star Sirius. So that is what they're asking, and then there's a follow-up question that, that uh, goes along with this, and I'll just give it, I'll give it all to you at once, and you do with it as you like. Okay. Um, were Christianity and Judaism created by secret societies to control the poor, and is it uh, not simply mind control to keep the masses docile, effectively. And uh, that this is tied together with this question about Sirius and the Dog Star in this very lengthy email, which um, I'm going to send you, by the way, since you sent me six, five, six paragraphs, I'm going to send you a membership. I'm not going to say who you are, but I'm going to send you a membership at my website just for taking the time to write out this treatise <laughs> where you yes. ask these questions. But, uh, yes. but I think you know what we're getting at here, and uh, I just throw it to you. Yes, well, uh, unfortunately, uh, many, many thousands and thousands of years ago, mankind began searching the heavens for wisdom and knowledge. And like Mr. Hall said, they weren't looking to learn about, they were looking into the heavens to learn from the stars. They were looking at the stars and the, and the constellations and the, and the sun and the moon and trying to uh, figure out where did these things come from. And that was the beginnings. And then for thousands of years, mankind has only been a handful, not all of mankind. The overwhelming majority of mankind are still on skateboards and watching, uh, you know, watching beavers and butthead. But there has been always in the history of mankind, there have always been those who were born into this world to become geniuses, 
to become brilliant minds because they study. When everybody else is out drinking and partying, they are researching and studying into the late hours of night and the early mornings. They're in universities reading, studying, calculating, understanding the words, the terms, where things have come from, and they become our great teachers, of which 90% of the people will never hear anything about because nobody seems to care about that kind of wisdom and knowledge. And so I've, I realized that a long time ago, and boy do I realize it now, that I have spent my entire life studying in university libraries uh, on my own, just sitting and reading and reading and reading and cross-referencing and cross-pollinating uh, uh, ideas and concepts with something that was said you know, 5,000 years ago by the Babylonians is now today we're saying the same identical thing, but we just don't know it. And so I, I've, I've decided that uh, the world of mankind is totally ill-informed and unread about the real history of the world that you live in. The history of this earth itself is staggering if you have the intellectual acumen to understand the uh, the perimeters of our history, we we have artifacts which are known to be handmade artifacts, which are found in the earth in such a de- uh, in such a depth in the earth that all the paleontologists and archaeologists all agree that at that depth, that far down into the earth. The strata is at least three to three and a half billion, with a B, three and a half billion years old strata going way down into the earth, as furthest we can go. You're digging into the earth that's three and a half billion years old, and yet we're finding handmade artifacts, strange and profoundly brilliant stuff. We're bringing up all kinds of handmade uh, 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 metals and rings and jewelry and, uh, and, and some of it having writings that we don't even relate to. And so it implies that there has been an intelligent people or intelligent life. I don't know what they were three billion years ago. But somebody was here three billion years ago because the handmade artifacts are now on display, which were dug out of uh, uh, strata, which is three and a half billion years old. So try and wrap your head around that. Try and wrap your mind around that. That life on this earth, intelligent life, and I do mean extraordinarily intelligent life, has been on this earth for three and a half billion years ago. Three and a half billion years ago, there was highly intelligent creatures on this earth. I don't know if they look like us, but I do know that they're, according to the science of today, we are now finding handmade artifacts in the oceans or beneath the oceans when they're drilling for oil. They hit the bottom of the ocean and they drill into the bottom, and they drill into the floor of the ocean. And as they're pumping it up, as the stuff comes up, they're finding handmade artifacts which are under the ocean floor. We have uh, pyramids the size of the Great Pyramid of Egypt on the Atlantic uh, on the Atlantic Ocean floor, ten miles north of the of the island of Bimini, in an area called the Bahama Banks, is an enormous pyramid sitting on the ocean floor. And how many people know that? And better still, how many people even care? You better care because there's something going on on this earth that we haven't been told. And the reason why is because the people who are given this knowledge and are, have know about it and who are looking at this kind of esoteric knowledge, it's a big club and you ain't in it. Right. This is oh. what George Carlin was talking about when you find out how much you have not been told because you are masters who believe that they own you. They have, con- they have actually framed mischief by law. They have actually created laws among themselves 
and those laws that they created say that they own all the poor working class people of the world. They own your body and they put you on their stock market. Mm. And so the people who run this planet are not about to tell you nothing. They don't figure you're smart enough to understand it and you're just getting in the way anyway because with your IQ, you wouldn't understand it anyway. And that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to crawl on your knees and pay your rent and go out and enjoy your beer and your pretzels and your and your ball games and your football and your tennis ball games and go out and play games with a ball and stay out of the way of the people who run this planet. Right. The Rockefellers don't care a damn about you or your family or the Rothschilds or any of the other international banking elite or the people who are the real powers behind the governments of this world. Don't ever think that the President of the United States is the most powerful man uh, in this country. He is not. He merely represents. He's a president of a company. He's not the owner of the company. Right. You better go back and find out where your country came from and who was running this planet behind your back that is is keeping you ignorant, ill-informed, and unread so that they can easily manipulate you into doing whatever they want you to do. So you're only good for one thing. If they need you in a war, they need some warm bodies to send over in a war, good. War is good for business, so you need to invest your son. So I'm just saying that if you wake up and find out that the world you live in is not being created by the God you thought was around you and thought that you, you know, God loves you, and then you find out you don't even know what the word God means. Yeah. And when you look at this word, uh, Sirius, the dog star, uh, first of all, this is where we get our word sir. So in the military, and when I was growing up in the South, I always learned to when talking to adults with yes ma'am and yes sir sir s-i-r comes from Sirius. so therefore the pharaohs of egypt were said to have come from Sirius. yes sir no sir military and so there is a whole militaristic presence on the earth which i have talked about before where all the armies of the world always march the same, the goose step is the same with the Nazis or with all the other uh, countries of the world, all the nations of the world have armies, navies. They have, uh, they have the merchant marines. They all salute the same way. They all wear the same signias, insignias. They... All the militaries of the world operate the same behind the scenes. My God, you need to wake up and find out your world is run by people you have no idea in the world who really is the power of America behind the scenes. Just as we look at the Roman Empire, we see Caesar, and we hear about the great Caesars of Rome, never realizing the Caesars were not the boss in Rome. The money is the boss in Rome. Right. The people with the money decided what the Caesar will do and what he won't do. The bankers. And now you're talking about behind the Caesars of Rome. You're talking about Arius Copernicus Pisos. P-I-C-O-S. Look it up for a change and realize Caesar merely was on his knees to his monetary masters. The Pisos people. And the Flavians, and when you begin to see the the real powers behind the Roman Empire were banking, demonic, depravity banking families. And they, they control the Roman people through religion, alcohol, drugs, sex, international uh, competitions of games. And my God, when you understand how this earth is actually run and who owns it, and how they control it, and then how your government works. And you got two, you got two parties, Democrats and Republicans in America, and we call them left wing and right wing. Why do we call the two parties left wing and right wing? That's because a, uh, uh, an eagle only has two wings. That's why the American eagle, the ball eagles on the American one dollar bill, 
If you look on the back of a $1 bill, you'll see an eagle with two wings, left wing and right wing. And you will see he has nine tail feathers, which is the Council of Nine. Most people have never heard of the Council of Nine, but you better go back and start doing some homework and find out the secret societies that founded this country and that financed this, this country's wars throughout the world and who they really are and what you are doing here. Because you don't know from a, you have no idea in the world where this world has come from, where it is now, and get ready, because it's going to go where it was already designed to go. Mm. So, so it's an incredible story of betrayal of the human family. Oh, absolutely. And look, there's just a couple other questions here, uh, two more that I want to dispose of. Uh, it's, it's fascinating, though. The Bimini Road is something that is not really focused upon in many presentations. I know very little about it. Uh, but what but was the term again? The, the Bimini Road. You know, you were talking oh, yes. about B- okay. Bimini, okay. and uh, so I only yeah. know about that structure that you know comes out, looks like a harbor underwater, and all that. Uh, yeah. I, I got to be honest with you, I'm kind of ignorant on that subject. But it is fascinating to me because I've studied a lot of Roman history. <clears throat> yep. Now, when they talk about the different emperors and Julius Caesar himself, uh, and any of these people, you take a look at them raising armies. And there's never any mention by mainstream historians who funds these things. These things didn't happen for free. Uh, you know, you, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't produce the, the you know, when, when you take a look at the phalanx that the, uh, that the Romans used, you had to manufacture shields. You had to manufacture these short stabbing swords they used, uh, in order to use the Roman phalanx in battle. You know, that costs money. <laughs> All right, but but you of notice of course it did. The, where did they get that money? And that's the same thing with Adolf Hitler. Uh, Germany was broke after the First World War was over. Germany was actually broke, and 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 it was said by the historians that every day, every afternoon, <clears throat> horse-drawn carriages would ride through the major cities of Germany and pick up the dead bodies. Mm-hmm. on the streets that had just actually starved to death and laid down and died on the street on the street corners because they were broke there was no money food right. was uh, had no food and people were dying uh and so the the horse drawn carriages would go through the cities of Germany and pick up all the dead bodies who had died that day and then out of that incredible, horrible situation of a, of a massive country like Germany being totally broke and starving, Adolf Hitler comes into power out of nowhere in 1920s, late 1920s. He comes into power and starts ranting and raving about, you know, this is, we should put an end to this terrible tragedy. And then all of a sudden he's been running for, uh, the, he's being run for the chancellor. Ship, and then he becomes chancellor, and all of a sudden, he's building the greatest standing military machine the world has ever seen. Adolf Hitler built the the greatest navy, the greatest standing army, the most well-fed, well-clothed, and well-army military industrial complex on the face of the earth. And mm-hmm. nobody seems to have ever asked a silly, childish question: Where did he get the money? Well, right. Uh, the funny thing is that a mainstream historian will try and explain to you that it was Fritz Tyson who funded the, the Third Reich's uh, military machine. Problem is that the machine that Hitler built cost way more than Fritz Tyson had. Um, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Mathematically, uh, it's impossible for Fritz Tyson to have funded uh, what would have been necessary to do all the things that Hitler did. It's, it's well, I mean, not there. we say that Wall Street, Wall Street is a classic example. Wall Street did this and Wall Street did that and Wall Street funded this and that. But when you talk about Wall Street, you're not talking about Wall Street. You're talking about a lot of guys that work on Wall Street. Right. You're talking about a lot of names, a lot of big names in banking and insurance companies and maritime admiralty shipping companies and big big institutions and large corporations not just one man no we're talking a wall street a whole conglomerate of powerful people who are together they are wealthy and they're going to stay wealthy and the way they all stay wealthy is they protect each other mm. like lawyers protect each other 
cops protect each other. Doctors protect each other. You know, and it's the poor people in the street. We don't protect nothing. We're just the saps that pay for everything. So when you you find out that the the Adolf Hitler financed the whole uh, Second World War, he financed the restoring of the Nazi empire and almost took over the world doing it. He was so powerful he could go into Russia, set up the war with the United States, England, Europe, Russia, and go into Africa, and the Nazis were all over the earth doing all kinds of things. Where did he get the money? Right. You know, I actually, I, I would like to ask a question, Jordan, since since we're talking about the Third Reich, and I want to link it back to the subject matter for tonight. Um, I, I still have two questions from listeners, by the way, <laughs> but okay. I want to throw one of my own in, if you don't mind. Um you know, I've, I've seen these very vague studies about the mystical aspects, the esoteric aspects of the SS. During yep. that time, there is a whole order, it appears, but the, the, the records are incomplete from what I know. I mean, I'm sure that there's lots of stuff that's captured and probably uh, still classified, you know, that, but we can't see it uh, as the public. We captured a lot of archives <clears throat> when the Third Reich fell. Uh, if you don't believe me, the guy who had access to three buildings worth of it wrote a book called The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, literally launching the entire genre of what we call modern contemporary history and literature. But, you know, the reality is that uh, most of the public has never seen the, these other weird aspects to the SS. It's not simply adherence to the leader. There was a, a, a mystical, I, I want to call it mystical, I want to call it esoteric, I want to call it a cult. And I think all three of these things qualify uh, aspect to the SS, which is not all of uh, the German army, which is not all of Germany, but uh, seem to be a, a, a kind of a club, if you will. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and I've never really heard too much about that, except to see that there's some evidence on it. Um, does that link to any of what it is we've talked about so far? So far, it's exactly what I'm talking about, precisely, uh-huh. <laughs> because because the SS SS was just one part of a far bigger bigger picture. Uh, the the best minds today on the earth there's there's quite a few brilliant people out there that I have an extraordinarily uh, high respect for. Their minds, they're brilliant people who have really done their homework. Anthony Sutton was probably the first one I would name, Anthony Sutton. I think he is no longer with us. But he has written so many books on the esoteric, hidden world of finance that the Nazis enjoyed. Mm -hmm. All of the mystical, dark stuff of where they got their money from and why all the U.S. banks, big banks like the uh, Manhattan, the big banks like Rockefeller's Bank, and uh, I would have been trying to say the Philadelphia Bank of um, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Guaranteed Trust, uh, the Rockefeller Bank, City Bank in Chicago, uh, the Commercial Bank in Georgia, and some of the biggest, actually the largest uh, uh, industrial complexes like General Electric, General Motors, Ford Motor Company, Eli Lilly Glass, Standard Oil, Union Oil, all of these big corporations, big banks, big industries, both in England and America, were all being financed and and sending money and materials to Germany. Coca-Cola, all the different drink companies, the food companies, General Mills, General Electric, General uh, Motors, uh, Ford Motor Company were all supplying hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars plus all of their equipment that they were producing here in America was being shipped directly to Germany to finance and supply Adolf Hitler for his war. But nobody seems to realize, yeah, you know, you're talking about high crimes and treason. Mm-hmm. You're talking about high crimes and treason where American corporations, big business, banking institutions, secret societies, fraternal orders were all behind Adolf Hitler, sending him money, 
sending him and the newspapers like the New York Times and the L.A. Times, all these big newspapers were, were, were working directly with Adolf Hitler. I mean, they even have a, a property out here in Southern California where Hitler was going to live once he took over the world. He was going to live and take and run the world from Los Angeles. And he has a big home that was here being built for him by the international bankers in, in, in New York and Chicago and San Francisco, Bank of America, the Giannini Banks. It's an incredible story of the real truth of the, of the world you live in. Anthony Sutton, look up his name, Anthony Sutton, and get his books. Also, living today, are two brilliant minds on the same subject you'll need to know about is Joseph Farrell, F-A-R-R-E-L-L, Joseph Farrell. Right. Nobody comes near him today. <clears throat> and, of course, there is Peter Lavenda, L-E-V-E-N-D-A, Peter Lavenda, Joseph Farrell, and Anthony Sutton. All three of these are monstrous, brilliant men who have explained the whole Second World War was financed, organized, and directed out of New York City. Absolutely. New York, the Empire State. Well, right, and even we, we know publicly that uh, people like Prescott Bush and other members of the uh, board at, uh, <laughs> you know, the First Bank of New York were all called on the carpet for trading with the enemy That's right. during World War II. This is this is the truth. Yeah, that would be the grandfather of uh, George H.W. Bush, or excuse me, the father of George H.W. Bush, the grandfather of George W. Bush. Yep. Uh, certainly he was caught up in it, but the truth is that uh, a lot of that is all American really american made even the and eugenics think, programs uh the concepts of eugenics yeah, really was american all, born. eugenics was the eugenics the getting rid of the the lower class of people for the new world order uh and all of that eugenics idea that nazism idea was given birth to not in germany not by by hitler at all no that whole idea was developed for New world order, a whole new race of, of people, eugenics that would have a blonde hair, blue eyed, a master race. That was all dreamt up on Laurel Canyon in Studio City in Los Angeles, up on Laurel Canyon, Mulholland Drive. There was a whole uh, cadre of, of Nazis, brilliant German theoreticians who lived up in the hills, what we call the Hollywood Hills, go up Laurel Canyon till you hit, uh, uh, till you hit Mulholland. You can take left or right, and there's all kinds of secret, brilliant people living up there, and they were there back in the 20s and 30s, living in the hills of Los Angeles, developing an idea for taking over the world out of Los Angeles, Studio City, and it was called, and it was referred to as Nazism. And boy, when you find out who was financing the Nazi philosophies and ideas and how it's connected to the different religions of today, it's an incredible story that you'd have to take about 50 years of your life and sit and just read and study everything so that your mind can be wrapped around the real truth of the world you live in. Right. Now, believe it or not, we've gone through the first hour here with Jordan Maxwell, and I've just really asked questions uh, that have either been posed in the chat room or have been emailed to me or whatever. You can uh, drop more in there if you like, but I've got two left from you guys. We're going to take <laughs> a break really quick, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get to everything that uh, that we have time for, and if not, well, this series will continue, I guess. This particular uh, episode seven will be focused more or less on answering people's questions. And uh, by the way, some people have dropped some links in the chat room to uh, some of the individuals that have been discussed here and uh, some relevant stuff. One of the authors, Jordan, mentioned there's a, it looks like a Wikipedia page. A few other things are on there. Um, and, and you can also go in there and share information with others who are listening to the show, either live or later on. It doesn't matter. Uh, I will collect questions and always ask Jordan. We won't necessarily devote another whole episode to it, but looks like that might be what we're going to do tonight, Jordan, if that's okay with you. That's okay with me. 
Uh, but but I enjoy this because you know all of these things are linked together. See, somebody might say, "Why are they discussing the Third Reich on a religion special?" Well, <laughs> because the Third Reich was a religion. There you go. And you know, you you can look to previous episodes where Jordan was discussing the German people and Judaism. And hey, how about their symbol, the swastika? Well. <laughs> Interesting, again, go back and listen to the earlier episodes. You'll find out a lot of interesting stuff there. But we are late going to the break, Jordan. So I am going to do that now. But you guys stick around. Jordan Maxwell will be back with me after a quick break and will continue asking them the questions that you guys have posed here at Ocelli.com. Uh, this is the Religion Special Part 7. We'll be right back. WallStreetWindow.com Gold Silver The Stock Market WallStreetWindow.com The brilliant author of The War State brings you exclusive reports about the big changes upcoming in the markets. WallStreetWindow.com Perhaps you're invested deeply. Perhaps you're not in deep enough. Maybe you're thinking about getting started. WallStreetWindow.com Michael Swanson, the brilliant author of The War State, understood these trends professionally for many years, and now he gives you the benefit of his knowledge. WallStreetWindow.com Go there now. Go there now. Go there now. Go there now. 